Hey everybody, Jenny Lohman, Hamilton County Recycling Solid Waste. I, Gage, did you introduce yourself? By the way, you're on. You're on mute, bud. Sorry, I thought you were going to be the star of the show. My name is Gage Bradford. I'm a community specialist with Hamilton County Recycling and Solid Waste. I'll be emceeing tonight. Um, so feel free, I'll be, I'll be jumping around the chat and the Q&A, checking out, making sure everybody's questions are answered. Um, my email is listed on screen there if questions come around afterwards. Um, hope you enjoy the show. Thank you, Gage. And uh, he is part of our team and I'm gonna do most of the presenting, but he's also gonna be checking the questions and answers chats and keeping me on track and let me know if I'm forgetting anything. So appreciate it very much. So welcome to uh, get the burk get the get the dirt on backyard composting. And at Hamilton County Recycling and Solid Waste is our mission to make sure things are not going into the landfill. And backyard composting is a great way to keep the organics out of the landfill. Thanks for joining us tonight. And of course, those of you um, that are wanting one of our, our uh, compost bins will be eligible after this to get the $10 off coupon. Once we verify that you have actually, actually participated in the webinar, so like don't click off now and think you're gonna get a $10 coupon. But uh, we'll, that coupon code will be sent when we send out the survey, which will probably be tomorrow, after we get all the attendees' names, then we can shoot off a survey monkey to you. You fill out the survey in at the in the very last question, it tells you the code for that in red writing. So don't forget when you're filling out that survey, if you want that $10 off coupon for the compost bin sale, then look for that compost coupon code within the survey monkey. Um, again, like Gage said, we are uh, recording this, but you are not being seen or heard right now. You can do everything in chat in q and I'm gonna go ahead and run through the presentation and hope that I actually answer your questions that you have on your mind. But if I don't, please, please do put them in the Q&A or the chat. So uh, we're, we're uh, certain to get to your, your question. So basically backyard composting is just the breakdown of any organic material. So if you happen to have a vegetable garden and that's what you're composting, or you just have leaf uh, leaves from your yard and you're composting those twigs, if you fruits and vegetable scraps, I take everything that used to be a fruit or a vegetable from my kitchen, those scraps, and I mix that in with, with my yard trimmings, uh, mostly leaves. Um, and we'll talk more about the ratios and what that is uh, later on. But basically it's the breakdown of plant in um, of anything that used to be in nature, right? And it happens uh, in, in the woods by itself. Uh, and that's why the soil in untouched areas like prairies that have never been mowed or tilled have really super deep root systems. And the soil in an um, untraveled place in the woods is very, um, crumbly and moist and feels and smells earthy because it's actually undisturbed soil. In our yard, we create a, an artificial environment when we cut our grass and rake our leaves. So the decay in the organic matter that is part of nature's cycle doesn't happen in our yard. So in order for us to get the organics back into our soil, we had to put them there and composting is the way to do that. And why would you wanna do that? Well, as you know, if you've ever dug a hole in your yard, our, our soil has got a lot of clay in it. So we need to amend our soil so that it's not just dirt or clay, it's actually um, this beautiful, you know, dark brown, crumbly, that, that cr those crumbles allow those roots to go deeper down. And when roots can go deeper down, it's, it's a more hardy plant and it can reach lower water, water um, at, when it, in, during drought times. It also, because it also lets the rain absorb that water. If you've seen any of this flooding that's happening on farmlands like last summer and the summer before that, it's because they, they till the soil and it's so compacted 
that it just runs right off. And that's clay, right? Clay doesn't like to absorb water. So when you put organic matter into your soil, you're allowing it to be aerated. You're allow, allowing it to also be, um, uh, to like absorb like a sponge. So, so, and also those earthworms are, are moving about in there and making more air holes for your plants to grow healthy um, root systems. So there's so many different benefits for compost um, that I can never get enough of it. And your plants will grow big and strong, just like these guys are. And just talking about what we're throwing into the landfill, we did a study in 2018, um, uh, residential waste. So this uh, is what, what we found out that thir about 32% of what we throw away could have been backyard composted. And if you talk about commercial composting where they can take more than we can do in our backyard, then that would almost be 50%, about 50% of what we throw into the landfill could actually be composted. So it, and, and as you can see, we also need to do a better job at recycling because really only 37% of what goes into the landfill today has to be there. Jenny, so, we aren't seeing that slide. Oh, they're not seeing the slide? What are they, what are we seeing? Uh, right now, we're just still seeing the pre-roll um, set. Oh no, okay, let me try to, let me, darn it. Thank you for, for telling. Let me bring up a 2018 waste characterization study of our Hamilton County landfills though, which she's- It did, John. it did, sorry. Okay, I'm gonna try to, to re, reshare. So you did see the study? Did not, but I was just going to throw in the link to the complete study. Okay, thank you. Are you seeing something different now? Yes. Let's hope that it will work now. Do you see the study? Yes, we do. Okay. Okay. So that's my picture of the, the really cool picture of uh, our, what uh, compost can do for your soil. Sorry, you missed it earlier. So, and this is the study that we did of our waste and talking about compostable paper. So that's like, if you have a, a pizza party, you can rip up those paper plates and put it in your compost. Uh, you can also use shredded cardboard. Um, the, the, uh, but again, we want you to recycle what you can recycle. Of course, you're never going to recycle a paper plate. Um, but if you can recycle newspaper and regular paper and that sort of thing, uh, please do. And then use your yard trimmings and the browns that we'll talk about later uh, for composting. And not only are you saving room in the landfill, but you are also helping uh, nature reduce its carbon footprint by because you're absorbing all that carbon into your soil, just like it does in nature. So the, the leaf litter that decays into the ground is uh, you know, happening um, in nature. So we are let, letting it happen when we add compost to our yards. And you can see the tractor in the back and he's tilling. And that's another way that carbon is released into the atmosphere. So you can reduce your carbon footprint for one thing, those organics are never leaving your backyard, so they are not being transported to go somewhere else. Even if your community has yard trimmings pick up, um, you're actually, would even be reducing your, your carbon footprint even more if you decided to just go ahead and start backyard composting because you're saving it from going from point A to point B, even though they are still composting it. But they're not all, all uh, municipalities in Hamilton County offer yard trimming pickup either. So um, I, I personally, or my community does not. So composting is really, really pretty simple. It's just like uh, you learn in grade school that all living things need food, air, and water. And that's what you're providing in your compost pile. So you pick a spot, so that's the home. You build that pile, right? And then you provide food, air, and water. And you can make it uh, difficult or you can make it easy. It depends on how much time you have. So when you pick a spot, you just wanna make sure that it is convenient. So you're gonna go out to it. Um, you want it to be three by three by three at least. 
um, because the, it needs that mass to be able to get the heat that it needs to generate those microorganisms to do their work and break down um, the yard trimmings as well as our food scraps. You don't wanna put it in a place that has got a stream running through it, right? You don't wanna um, make it too wet. And so you need to have good drainage. You want it to be able to sit on the earth um, unless you have one of the tumbler types that you turn uh, because those microorganisms are gonna go up to into it automatically. And then don't put it right next to a tree because the roots can grow into it. And if you put it next to a wood structure, it's possible that you can start to de decay your wood structure structure and be a good neighbor don't stick it right underneath their their bedroom window but you, you know you're probably going to take such good care of your compost pile that even if you did do that it would never be an issue so this is the most generic right just build a pile um, doesn't cost anything other than labor um, it has good dra drainage it's easy other than the wind's going to blow some stuff away but most of us don't live on a farm or have a lot of acreage where we can just do that um, and it's not going to keep the animals out. And of course, if you live on a farm, you're going to have animals. So that doesn't matter. So that's one way you could just like maybe store, store your uh, leaves. I store my, some of my leaves in just an open wire bin like this. And again, it's cheap and it has good drainage. The rain can get to it, um, access to soil organisms, and it will keep some of the animals out. And you could actually do all your composting in this. I just prefer uh, something a little bit more sturdy. And that's why I've, I've bought a couple of these compost bins. I also have an open bin as well. So these plastic bins, and this is an, an example of, of one that is uh, just like the ones we're gonna sell at our compost bin sale. Um, so they do have good drainage because they're open on the bottom. So the soil organisms can get to them because they're black, the sun's gonna be able to um, beat down and get heated up quicker than it would if it was just an open pile. Um, but it does have a lid and that's gonna keep the animals out, but you, it's also gonna keep the rain out. So I like my open bin because I don't have to water it hardly at all because the rain does that for me and fruits and vegetables have a whole lot of water. Um, so often after I turn it once, I realize, hey, you know what? It didn't really need any water. It just needed to be turned. And, um, but the thing with this is eight, it's 80 gallons. And if you look at some of those, um, the, the, the turn, turning ones, I'm losing, losing the word on it um, right now, but we'll talk about it later. The ones that are off the ground. Tumbler. Thank you, Tumbler. Uh, the capacity is only like 37 gallons as opposed to this is 80 gallons. But I, I, like I said, I still, I have a couple because I like one that's working and then one that's either seasoning or I'm using for storage. This is a tumbler, right? So this is sort of the Cadillac of it. And this one is a bigger one. It's easy to turn. So that's why people love it. They keep it off, it keeps off the ground. So here's the thing. It takes a little bit more work because you're gonna have to throw a couple handfuls of topsoil in there every time you're starting it because those microorganisms can't get to it. You don't wanna throw any worms in there because honestly the worms um, are gonna bake, right? It heats up quick, just like a, a hanging plant does. So you're gonna need it. Uh, you'll get compost quicker because uh, the hotter it gets, the quicker it breaks down, but you're also going to have to water it more just like you would um, a hanging plant. So this is the three bin system and it has the open sides. There are three bin systems that have the hard wire cloth that cover the top um, and some, sometimes the so sides so that no animals can get into them, but certainly animals can get into this one. But I like this example because it shows the different steps. So step one, it can be your storage where you've got your browns and we'll talk about browns later. Step two is maybe the pile that you're working. And step three, as you can see, it looks like soil. That's what compost looks like when it's finished. So they might just be seasoning that a little bit more before they spread it. Because I can't imagine they're just letting it sit there because I know for, uh, and, my, and anybody I know really never makes enough in their backyard to use for everything they want around their yard. But again, this is great if, if you're handy and, and there's all kinds of uh, different designs on, on the internet that you can find. So how are you gonna start your pile? You basically, you start with you about two feet and this is not a perfect science. Don't get um, you know a little 
overwhelmed with ratios and stuff like that uh, of leaves. So leaves we call browns or carbons. And that's how you want to start it. And it's on the ground. So it's on the earth. And you start with those leaves. Here's the thing. I, I have oak leaves and I have so many people ask me, oh, oak leaves, you know, they are terrible for composting. Actually, they're not. They, they're not as lovely as a maple leaf. Um, just think of, of it as, as anything, the more denser or tough something is, like a magnolia leaf, for instance, the longer it, it's going to take to break down. So a peach pit and a stick and the stem of a pumpkin, I can tell you, are, are all going to take a while to break down. If any pits like that or, you know, avocado pits, stuff like that. They're going to take longer than, say, melon or a carrot top or the bottom of a lettuce or your apple core, banana peels. Those are all going to disappear pretty quickly. So just the denser it is, the longer it takes to break down. And another thing is, like, like I said, with my oak leaves, what I try to do is mulch mow them before I store them because I don't have a chip, chipper shredder. But... Um, of course, I have so many oak leaves, I don't always get to that in time. I just got to get them up. So I do use them whole and it just takes a little bit longer. So the smaller pieces you're putting into your compost bin, no matter if it's your carbon, your brown, or your nitrogen, your green, the smaller the pieces, the quicker it's going to break down. So those microorganisms can just think about, you know, if you have a piece of melon rind this big as opposed to this big how many more surface areas the microorganisms can get to on a smaller piece um, to chew it up quicker. And it's really the microorganisms, even though you can't see them. And the worms and the pill bugs and all those other decomposers, they're gonna come too to your compost pile. You don't have to buy anything to throw in there. Some people do like to throw some topsoil on uh, when they're starting too. So this young man you can see has started with his browns, his leaves, and two feet is the rule of thumb to start. And then you start throwing your nitrogens on top of that. So your nitrogens are your greens. And the next slide I believe is the one that will show some examples of that. But you're always gonna wanna cover with your browns um, after you put your greens on. And that is so that you're not attracting um, animals or flying insects. Of course, I am not a perfect composter. I don't, I don't have time to spend as much time as I would like composting. So I'm lazy sometimes. I'll just go throw my vegetable scraps out there and come back a few days later and cover them up with, with the leaves. Um, and I will get some flying insects, but I don't mind that because they're not harmful to my compost. It, some people just don't like insects to begin with. So if you're one of those people, just make sure you're covering it. So any smells uh, won't be an attraction for, for any animal, big or small. So talking about the greens and the nitrogens, I use those two terms interchangeably. So the nitrogen rich materials includes any fruit or vegetable scrap from your kitchen. You might see an eggshell in there, which obviously is not a fruit or a vegetable, but it is one thing that you can add to your compost. The more you pulverize them, the better, just because they take forever to break down, but they add great calcium and, not, and some nitrogen to your soil. Um, coffee grounds and tea bags, um, slimy pasta you forgot about um, are all nitrogen rich materials, as well as any green stuff from your yard. So if you just trimmed up a bunch of your dandelions, and they haven't gone to seed yet, you can throw those in. And that's a nitrogen because it's green. This time of year when we've got, you know, your grass is growing like crazy, um, we recommend that you, you mulch mow your lawn because green grass is a nitrogen and it can add up to 30% of the nitrogen needs that your lawn requires. Um, but if you have, you know, just worked and didn't get to it and you've got way too much grass and you wanna bag it, you can put that in your compost pile as well, and that will be a nitrogen. However, if you have a pile that has turned into like what looks like hay, so it's brown grass, it is then becomes a carbon. So the carbon rich materials include leaves, 
um, dry grass and twigs, wood chips, sawdust, even newspaper. This time of year, if you're looking for leaves and you can't find any, you can certainly start off with newspaper. Uh, there is a woodworking club in Kennedy Heights and uh, they, they have offered people to come by if they like, and they typically will have sawdust or wood chips available um, for you to pick up and they set them over by the dumpster. Honestly, I haven't talked to them since the whole COVID started and you know, with people social distancing, whether that guild, that wood guild is still you know, in operation, but, it, but it's worth, a, worth a, an ask. Um, so those are just some samples, straw, hay, et cetera, that can be a carbon rich. So you want one part nitrogen and three part carbons. And again, the ratios are sort of, um, you figure it out on your own. It does, it's not anything that, that is very scientific, but uh, you'll, you'll just kind of get to know it. If it becomes too wet, you probably need to add some more carbon. Or if it's too dry, you probably need to add some more nitrogen. So, uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Some other things that you can um, compost that are, are kind of unusual are is moldy bread. If you let that get uh, moldy, just you can throw the whole thing in there. Uh, that's a picture of moldy cake. I, you know, I don't know whoever would let that get moldy, but wood ash, wood ash is a base and um, our soil, I think the pH is right around seven, seven and a half for, for healthy soil. And since that's a base, uh, you don't wanna to add too much at one time. Just like you don't wanna throw in, if you happen to run a lemonade stand and you have you know three bushels of lemon rinds, you probably don't wanna throw those in your compost all at once because that's very acidic. Uh, so as long as you know you're pretty much typical household of a variety of items, uh, you don't have to worry about, oh, is this too much or is there anything that I can't compost that I shouldn't compost? And there is, and we'll get to that. But herbivores, so rabbits and chickens, for instance, they only, uh, I can't say this about chickens, but rabbits for sure only eat, are vegetarians. So um, their, their poop is great nitrogen source and will really heat up your compost pile. Same with chicken waste. Um, although people that have chickens tell me, I, I don't have to compost because my chickens eat everything. But if you can get a hold of some chicken poop, if you need to heat up your pile, that's a great way to do it. Um, again, um, something that I found out about my oak leaves. So if you're like me and have oak leaves, they are a bit acidic. So it's nice to have that um, base, um, which is, are those that wood ash also to add to your compost. But the Hamilton County Soil and Water Conservation District sells these soil testing kits. And I recommend everybody just test your soil to see what it needs. And that, that clump of clay that I showed earlier, I actually dug that out of my yard under the lawn. And um, you, you send soil samples up to Michigan State and then they email you a report and my report said I needed to throw an inch of compost across my entire lawn because I had no organic matter in, in my soil. So it's good to always just have your soil checked to see what it really needs. Some of the things you don't want to compost, meat and bones, dog and cat feces, weeds with seeds, and dairy products. And I'll add to that also anything that's oily. So somebody had asked me about, you know, I always clean out uh, my bacon grease from my, my, can, um, from my pan, uh, the paper towels. Yeah, paper towels are compostable, but don't do it if you're like wiping out greasy stuff with it because that oil and all these things, well, most of the things you see in that picture um, are gonna attract animals. They get stinky and our compost just doesn't heat up enough to burn out all the pathogens that dogs and cats uh, produce as well as they don't burn out all the seeds. That's why we say don't add weeds with seeds. Um, I know that I constantly get tomato volunteers whenever I dig a hole in my yard and throw some compost in there. I, I have actually don't even have to buy like cherry tomato plants um, every year because they pop up in my yard. So that, that's, a, that's kind of a perk, but I don't want dandelions popping up um, unintentionally. There, there are enough of an issue. 
Although, you know, I had a neighbor that made dandelion wine, so it's all, all the way you look at it, right? So some other things you do not want to compost uh, in your backyard compost, that's a picture of a black walnut up in the upper left. Uh, and those black walnuts are toxic plants and most other plants will not grow around them. So please do not put your black walnut leaves or seeds, nuts in, in your compost. We recommend that you not um, bag your grass that has been um, treated for uh, pesticides. Those microorganisms in our, in our compost, um, you know, they're, they're pests to some people. Um, so we don't want to kill them. And we don't know how long that stuff lasts um, either. But, you know, we're, we're also not the, you know, pesticide police at the district. Uh, if you want to throw your lawn clippings in there that has been treated and you're just using it on your flower beds anyway, instead of your vegetable garden, that's completely up to you. The picture of the utensils are compostable utensils. However, compostable goods do not break down in a backyard compost. Again, they, the commercial composters are able to sh shred these and they have much higher heat. That's why they can take the meats and bones and some of the other things we don't put in our backyard. So if you get those little plastic uh, plant-based cups that are say they're compostable, they're not gonna co break down in your backyard. Um, so, so we just always, uh, try to persuade people to reuse, like and wash your dishes and, and stuff like that when you entertain. So those are some of the other things that should not be going into your backyard compost. And when you provide water, uh, you want your compost to be like a wrung out sponge in its moisture content. More than that, it's going to get stinky and less than that, it's going to be too dry and it's, it's not going to decompose. So like I said, fruits and vegetables, they're anywhere from 40 to 90% uh, water. And uh, so that will help out with that. And also when I turn it, sometimes it's moist underneath, it just dried on top because it was um, you know, in the sun. So the only time I really need to water my compost is typically July, August when we're in drought and it's like 90 degrees outside for some weeks. And when I do water my compost, I do have a rain barrel. I use that water just because it's unchlorinated. And if you don't have a rain barrel, you're welcome to use hose water. I just would recommend that you fill a bucket, like a five gallon bucket full of water, like earlier in the day, let it sit out for a few hours in the sun so that chlorine that's in our water can dissipate and before you put it on your compost pile. And again, it's one of these, you know, how much time do you have? How much work do you want to do? If you just don't have that time, throw your hose on there. It's not going to, you know, damage your compost. You know, it's going to kill some microorganisms with the chlorine because, of course, we want to drink clean water. So um, that's why we just recommend that you dechlorinate before you put it on your compost pile. But put, it, uh, put your hose on a fine mist, you'll be fine. Providing air. So this is something I think a lot of people don't do enough of. Uh, and so they say, well, I, I'm, I'm comp and you can compost and not turn, but it's going to take a long time, like a year for your compost to happen. Um, so turning it is important. And here we have a couple different um, bins and a couple different um, tools. So you see the pitchfork there that she has in, in, in the nice hardware bin that I was talking about earlier that will keep out the animals. Those slats come up out of it so she can get in there and work it. And then there's like a, a lever door on top that's hardware so the rain can get in it, but the animals can't get in it. Uh, so anyway, that is, uh, I have a pitchfork now, but I started off with, with a you know just a regular shovel and that does the job too. And then it's kind of hard in the plastic bins to really get the leverage you need uh, with a pitchfork or a shovel. So they do sell these wing diggers and it is something that you'll be able to purchase along with the compost bin at the sale that uh, we're having. And this is actually the, actually the wing, what the wing digger looks like. It's, it's pretty long so you can you know, put it down into the plastic bins. What happens, and I kind of say it's fluffing, um, the wing digger, when you push it down, right? It's like that and then when you pull up, it, it just fluffs so the oxygen can get in there. 
And those plastic bins do have some air holes on the sides that are just like slits. So that just helps to, you know, to get that oxygen in there because those microorganisms need oxygen to work harder. And also the fact sometimes like even um, in my open bin this year, when I turned it, a lot of my leaves were clumped together and I just needed to break those apart a little bit so that um, the microorganisms, so it's not just like a layered brick, right? So that they can be broken apart. So that's another reason to break that stuff up and allow oxygen and fluff to get in there. So those are a couple different ways that you can turn. And somebody had uh, sent us an email um, asking how often should I turn? And in, I, in the summertime, like starting in the spring through the fall, I, I do it every couple weeks, if not weekly, but other recommendations are like every two weeks to a month. Um, but you'll get compost quicker, during, especially during the summer if you're turning it more often. Um, but uh, again, you know, it's as much work as you want to put into it. In the winter time, just like we need shelter, so do those microorganisms, the worms, et cetera. So we layer and we call that lasagna layering. And so you're just gonna put your greens, which is on the left-hand side. And then you're gonna put your browns, your greens, your browns, your greens, your browns, and you're not gonna turn it because they need to stay in the center and, and stay warm and not freeze out. But I can tell you that everything you see in that picture there is going to be decomposed in the night, the, the nitrogens, I, I, when I say, because the leaves, some of the leaves will still be there, of course, but I won't be able to find any, anything like that in the spring uh, that you see on, on. So composting does happen in the wintertime. It just doesn't happen as quickly. And again, like I said, I'm going to find the stems, probably, you know, the, the cores of uh, uh, avocados, et cetera, um, once I start turning it again in the spring. And then, and then I continue to turn it from spring again until fall when it really starts to get cold again. You know, it's working because it's going to heat up. And even though I've never seen steam like that coming off my personal compost bin at home. I have seen it happen at a farm. Uh, and I have seen it when I've dug into my compost at the beginning of spring, and I'm trying to, to get a good product to show when I do my live seminars. I've dug into the middle of my compost pile to get good, and I've seen steam then. But that's the only time I've, I've seen steam. But I do know that it's working, not because I purchased a compost thermometer, which, which you can, uh, they've got a really long stem on them. Uh, but honestly, all I do is I know it's working because when I turn it, it shrinks. The next day you walk out there and it's smaller. There's, you know, a level down. And that's because as it's decomposing, right, the, the mass is, be, is getting more dense. So that's how, why it's shrinking because it's working. It's turning into this beautiful organic matter that... And I'm not sure how, how well you can see this, but this is, you know, compost. And that used to be banana peels and, and oak leaves and, and anything else, coffee grounds, et cetera, from my kitchen. But the thermometer, looking at that, you see it says 80 to 160. I'm thinking my, my personal uh, compost probably doesn't go past 110. And that's another reason why you don't want to put your animal feces in there, I, I should say dog and cat. Um, or if you have a baby and you use compostable diapers, you, you probably don't wanna do that either. Uh, and because it just, it doesn't heat up. That's 160, that's for commercial composting. That's not gonna happen in our yard. And think, of, and think about when they say, you know, the safety of meat to eat has to be at least 145, if not 165. Uh, our compost, that's why we don't put those weed seeds in there and you know all the meats and bones and stuff like that. It's just not gonna break down uh, like it would um, in a commercial composting. And are we there yet? You know you're ready to harvest your compost if it looks like soil, it smells like soil, 
it's cool to the touch. If it's still warm, that means it's still baking, it's still seasoning. If it still looks like a, a twig or a banana peel, then it's not ready. So if it looks like soil and it smells like soil and it's cool to the touch, then it is ready. And harvesting finished compost. So um, I never used to screen my compost. And I thought, you know, why, why should I bother? I'm just digging a hole and throwing it in there. I'm, I never have enough to use it as mulch around my flower beds and stuff like that. So, um, but then I, then I thought, you know, I, I really need to, to do this so I can talk about it during these seminars. And ever since I did that, I love it. I, I love screening my compost. And I have a, a little sample here of what a screen screener looks like. Of course, the one in the picture is, is the kind you wanna use. You don't wanna use a dinky one, but I kinda of like my, this vision. Um, but anyway, you can see the hardware is basically just, you know, stapled or nailed onto um, some, some wood. So what you do is you just take a gloved hand or your shovel and you throw your compost on top of it, give it a shake. Um, and then the really nice stuff goes down into onto your tarp or your into a bucket or whatever you have there. Um, and then whatever's left on top is probably twigs and seeds and stuff like that. You just throw back in to your compost because it needs to, right? It needs some extra time to work. So that's uh, harvesting your finished compost and using your compost. Anywhere in my yard, I dig a hole. I'm adding about one third compost to that hole. And because we have clay soil, what I have read is that you should break up that clay soil so that it becomes like golf ball sized pieces and then add the soil back in. So you don't want to fill a hole with just compost because compost is not soil. Compost is like living on um, a Snickers bar. You're going to get a lot of energy to start, but then you're going to eventually fade out and uh, because it's just not the nutrition you need. That's the same with our plants. You, you, they have to have the other nutrients that soil provide, which are minerals and you know little pieces of rock to cling to and stuff like that. Um, so about one third compost to two thirds of whatever else is the, your, your earth. You can also top dress your, your gardens with it. And like I said, your, your grassy areas, I just throw it right on top of the grass and you would think, how do you do that? But it does, after a couple of rains, just goes, goes away. And you can also include it uh, to potting your plants. So again, one third compost, two thirds potting soil. And potting soil is, um, is, is, doesn't have any living things in it. So if you do have a tumbler bin, don't throw, throw potting soil in there thinking microorganisms will get in that way. You have to use the stuff from the earth because that's where all the good microorganisms are. And getting back to the mold that you saw on the, the bread, um, I, and I find like uh, strawberry tops or a strawberry that's bruised on one uh, side that I've cut off and thrown into my kitchen collector. Um, next morning, it'll have white fur all over it. And of course, fungus, fungi are decomposers. So th those are wonderful things to see on, on in your in your compost pile. So don't be afraid of, of furry, uh, moldy things. So this is the kitchen collector that also will be sold along with the compost bins. And this is something similar to what I keep on my kitchen counter. So when I'm done with my coffee, I throw the coffee and the filter right in there as, as well as just like the tops of my strawberries, cores of my apples, banana peels, you know, the, the rotten tomato, you know, that sort of thing, all that goes in then. I take it out um, every once in a while. Let's say if it's really freezing in the winter time and I don't wanna go out there, I can, I can either freeze it or just in my freezer or just like throw it in the garage until I'm ready to go out to my um, compost pile. Um, some people that, that, uh, that, you know, live, live in apartments, they, they also, they can take it to a drop off site, but we'll talk about that in a little bit. So that's a kitchen collector, but you don't need to have something special to collect your uh, fruit and vegetable scraps and your slimy stuff. Uh, pasta, 
um, at your in your kitchen. You could just use a, you, uh, an old coffee can or a Rubbermaid container or something like that. So don't think you need to have all these special equipments uh, to be able to compost. And a couple of things that people tell me, um, the, a lot of the questions that I get at the live seminars are, it, it's my compost is not working. It's just sitting there. And it's, I think the two biggest problem, well, the one biggest problem on why compost doesn't work is because they're not turning it. So it doesn't have any oxygen. Or like I had one person that was just throwing fruits and vegetable scraps in there and that got stinky because they didn't have any browns and you've got to have a ratio, right? Of browns and greens. It's not going to work with just one or the other, or the, although the, the leaves eventually will break down, right? But um, you're, you want to be able to turn it and to get quick, to get compost quicker. The other complaint is sometimes people say, you know, it, it got stinky. I don't know what I did wrong. So like if it rained a ton and it's super wet, just add some more browns to it because it will turn with uh, um, anaerobic, which kind of smells septic-y um, if it's too wet. And sometimes if it's rained a ton and I'm turning it and it's super wet, I'm like, whoo, I just throw some more leaves in there and that, that just solves it right then and there. Um, do it yourself bins if you're handy. Uh, you can build it yourself. There are so many different um, recipes on Google. You know, you could made out of pallets, but people tell me, yeah, you make them out of pallets, but they'll eventually decay because it is made out of wood. Like this is, I think is a cedar wood. That's not, I think that's like a very high priced wood that does not decay. And that's, but uh, this actually is a, a picture from a Wyoming in here, here in Hamilton County, where they have built a system for their restaurants to use in the village of, of Wyoming. Um, and they take all their back of house scraps and they take them there and they're making compost. And uh, it's, I think it's a, it's a great thing. And so many schools are doing it now and even businesses, right, are doing that for their employees. So, uh, you know, we can help you out with all that. Um, if you're interested, Hamilton County, of course, supports all, all that not just backyard composting. There's all kinds of bins that you can purchase. Uh, we've got the tumbler types and the one on the, the bottom right is called a geo bin. And basically it's a piece of plastic that you just stretch out like that. Um, and uh, the one in the mid top is, is the one that we are selling. And typically they, they retail for like 90, hundred bucks, but we're able to get them uh, for $45. So um, it's truly a, a great deal. So those are just examples of the, of the kind that you can purchase. And the one, the tumbler that's on the, the upper left, you actually like think about rolling a barrel. That's how it's got a base and that's how you turn that one. And the other two um, tumblers, I think I, I saw those like those at um, Sam's a couple of years ago but I haven't seen them um, at the big box stores lately. Um, if you're excited to get started and you need leaves, these are some communities that I know of that will share either wood chips or maybe leaves if, if they collect from their residents. Some of these places will say it's only for our residents. Others are like, you know what, if we have any left, anybody that wants them can come and get them. Other places are like, oh, you got to call the office and you got to come at 10 a.m. and you got to check in with this person and bring your own this and that. So it's always best if you're looking for leaves. If you first, if you live in one of these communities, call your public service people and ask um, how you go about getting some. Um, and if you don't live in one of those communities, you can always try to call them and ask if they'll allow you to come and get some. There's also a private Facebook group, the Greater Cincinnati Leaf Exchange. You can go there and request some leaves if you'd like. Uh, since it's you know springtime, and I always collect a bunch of leaves um, in the fall, of course, and, and store them. And you can store them as easily as just in you know big plastic bags, so uh, so you have them all year year round. And this is just a, a little. Uh, 
talk on cicadas that are coming out like as we speak, uh, at least in my neighborhood, somebody said they saw some holes in the ground. So this is why cicadas are gonna be great for our compost uh, because they, when they're emerging from the ground, they're actually aerating the ground and turning over the soil. When they slit holes in your trees to, to lay their eggs, that, that's nature's pruning. And if you have a fruit tree, it'll be more fruitful next year. However, I did read if you have baby trees to protect them. Um, if you allow their carcasses to decay in, they are going to add nitrogen plus a whole bunch of different nutrients back into your soil. Um, so I wouldn't be worried about if they get into your compost because really, you know, the nature's web, there's, there's more than just decomposers in your compost pile. You, you know, you've probably seen centipedes, those are predators, ants are predators. But, uh, you know, it's all part of the web and it's all adds nutrition back into our soil. Um, and if you're interested, uh, I did read that the white ones, like you can see on the left there, are very delicious if you happen to like asparagus in a can, because that's what I read they taste like. And I would love it if somebody on this Zoom webinar wants to take a picture of actually eating them and describe how it was and send it to me. I would love to share that on Facebook or in a blog post or something like that. So give them a try if you dare. Um, if you, after listening to this, you're like, you know what, this year is not going to be good for me. I, you know, but I do want to keep the organics out of the landfill. You, there are options now in Cincinnati. There are some small entrepreneurs that, that are willing to come and get your compost, your food scraps from you. Uh, and there is a, a charge for that. Uh, they are, they are in business to make money. So there's four different businesses that we know of so far. The Better Bin Compost Company, Local Compost, um, Go Zero Services, and then Queen City Commons. And they have a variety of options. Either they can get it from your house or you can drop it off maybe at a farmer's market or uh, some main area somewhere about town. You can even start one in your own neighborhood if you want. So those are options are all on our website as well. And it's hamiltoncountyrecycles.org, as you can see. You can find all that information there as well as sign up for our compost blog that comes out about every other week. Um, it's just a lighthearted kind of how to troubleshooting funny stories blog post. Uh, we have a compost guide that you can download a digital copy of that. And then of course, a lot of you are here because you really want that $10 off coupon, love saving money. Um, and remember that's coming with the survey and it will be in the survey, the, the code that you need. And you can contact either Gage or I with any questions that you have concerning composting or the sale. And that is pretty much a wrap up of my presentation. And I see that we've got quite a few questions and, and some in the chat. So please, please let me know what I need to, to answer Gage, thank you. So everyone that's still here with us, please feel free to continue putting questions in the chat or the Q&A, but we can get started. Jenny, I know you've touched on a lot of this already, but just in case um, they need some reiteration, we're going to roll sure. these. Um, I've heard we can compost lint from our dryer. Is that true? You know what? As, as a prior Girl Scout camping mom, I found out years ago that there's so much polyester, you know, and, and today it's even worse. Uh, I don't recommend it only because, you know, microplastics are an issue in our soil anyway. And because unless you are a person that only buys organic cotton and linen, um, everything, I do not recommend it. Thank you, Jenny. Mm -hmm. Like Lauren Hart, um, the tumbler caught her eye. How do we know when to add water to a tumbler? Is it like a, uh, a wrung out sponge or is it drier than that? And if it's wetter than that, add some of your carbons, your dries. 
With a three bin system, how long does it take to move from one end to the other and get some fertile compost? Well, I can tell you when I had more time on my hands a few summers ago, I was turning my compost a couple times a week and I was getting compost about every six weeks. But last year when I didn't have as much time, I only harvested at the beginning of summer and the end of summer. So it depends on how much time you put into it. And again, if you're going to cut things, I had somebody say, oh, I like to cut the, put things in my blender. And then, I, you know what? I, I would never go that far. I would not cut things into cues because I actually enjoy chopping things with a shovel and just putting some aggression out while I'm in my compost mode. So it, it's, it depends on how much you're going to work it. Along those lines, can you work it or turn it too often? Uh, that's a good question. I, th I think you can because it has to generate that heat, right? So if it's 90 degrees out, I would say, nah, that's hot composting. But if, like in this weather, I wouldn't do it more than once a week. Thank you. Um, back to the chicken and um, rabbit question. Looks like Michelle um, owns five chickens and three guinea pigs. Can you love you. much chicken poop or small animal bedding into your compost? Absolutely. Absolutely. That bedding, right, is like, like wood shavings. So I would say, unless you're, you know what, and, I, and I, I haven't had a hamster since I was in third grade. So, you know, I don't know uh, what, what they make the bedding out of anymore. But if it's got any synthetic in it, don't. And that reminds me of like when I talked about the wood ash and adding that, do not add charcoal briquettes because those have a petroleum base. So that's the difference between charcoal ash and wood ash, right? It's like, you know, what question is coming next, Jenny? So this is from an anonymous attendee. Um, should you throw in leftover hardwood charcoal from a charcoal grill? Har Hardwood, absolutely, yes. Okay, wrapping up towards the bottom of the list, still several to work through here. If someone doesn't have access to leaves in their backyard, maybe can't get any luck going on the Facebook group or through their township, um, can they use newspaper consistently? Yes. For their cover? I, I Okay, the, 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 with the newspaper, you don't want to use the slick advertisements like magazine because those have uh, what makes them shiny and glossy is clay, and you don't want to add that to your compost. Um, you also don't want to use shredded office paper because office paper tends to clump and it's going to blow away. Besides, office paper is a super high quality paper that we want you to recycle, whereas newspaper has been recycled so many times that that's why it kind of disintegrates when it gets wet uh, because it's super short fibers. So newspapers are fine. Um, citrus is okay. Absolutely. I think someone got a little concerned about your lemonade stand, um, but no, unless you've got bukus of, of lemon rinds, you're gonna be just right. fine. Right. Um, can you put the tomato seeds in the compost? Will they grow in there? So I actually never thought that anything would grow out of my compost pile until last year. But I think, like I said, I wasn't working it like I had in previous years. So I think it actually, the roots got down into the soil below. I got uh, acorn squash and um, I think it was um, a butternut squash. I, I let the vines grow because I'm always interested to see if they're going to go to fruit. Normally, they only go to flower, but you can eat the flowers of squash, like in salads, and throw it on your soup for a little prettiness. Um, so I just kind of let it go, and I ended up getting them. But typically, in a compost pile, things will burst out of their seed, and, um, and then they'll die because it just doesn't have all the stuff that soil you need in soil. So for the most part, you don't typically get anything to grow on your compost. 
How about cat, dog, or human hair? Hair is fine. It does take a long time to break down. And I did hear that it deters, um, I think it's um, deer, if you like stick it under where, whatever your deers like to eat, but. Um, cedar shavings? Yes. Um, and Jenny, we had a slide on it, but for anyone that's still maybe unsure, could you talk about the specific type of composter that is in our sale? The, yeah. Uh, the plastic yes. Box. And I'm trying, I'm wondering if I stop sharing, do you happen to have that pulled, pulled up the sale, the sale um, website? Yes. Yeah, I can share that. I'll stop sharing and then, and then you can share if you don't mind. And since we've only got three or four minutes left here, this would this is a great time to share my screen anyway. I want to show everyone. I want to show everyone um, our website. So here's the home page. Can you see that? I can. All right. So here's our home page, HamiltonCountyRecycles.org. If you go to residence. We are in a backyard composting seminar right now. If you go to residence over here under composting, go to the compost bin sale. She had a slide with the earth machine up here earlier. So this is the look of it. Um, Jenny, I think you've got experience with these. You might even have more than one. Happy with the product? I am. And here's the link to the actual shop where you could Select what kit you want. Maybe you don't want a wing dinger and a kitchen pail. So you just go here, enter your coupon. Um, should be pretty straightforward. So HamiltonCountyRecycles.org. Go to the composting section under residence. Booyah. And, and remember, if you're going to do the, um, the, if you want the $10 coupon, don't pre-order pre until you get that coupon code. And if uh, it, it does not uh, apply to the rain barrel, because we're a solid waste district, we're trying to keep things out of the landfill. But I, I love rain barrels too. We just can't offer that subsidized cost for rain barrels. Um, and yes, you do have to be a Hamilton County resident to get the coupon, but anybody that wants to come to our sale can order, and you're still getting a great price at under $46 for a composter. And the rain barrels were also discounted. Yeah, so just to reiterate, anybody, you know, Claremont Butler, anybody can go to our website and access the shop and purchase a compost bin. You just won't be eligible for the coupon. Uh, Nick, your coupon will be in the survey that will be sent to you within the coming day or two. Um, it, it will be in the last question. I'm trying to just go through these questions one last time before we have to get out of here. Um, when should you add, Jenny, when should you add compost to your soil or your garden? Anytime. But anytime that I'm planting a new plant, I, I do that. But you can top dress at any time. Um, so there's never a bad time for that. Well, I think we have ran through every question. Jenny, you answered every single one. Um, so I think that should do it unless there's any last minute entries in the chat there. I don't see any. Yep, I see. Well, Joanne just asked if a Kentucky resident. Yes, you can buy at our compass bin sale, um, Joanne, but you're just not gonna be able to use a $10 off coupon. That's only for people that live within Hamilton County. And I hope that we answered all your questions if we somehow Missed anything, please feel free to email one of us and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. And at that, it is 7.30, so hasta la vista, babies. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Jenny. All right, take care.